And we're live. Cool. Uh, hey, everyone, and welcome. I'm Scott Cohen from AGP Ventures in Boston, along with David Yahid, based in Renana. Welcome to our latest edition of AGP Access, which is our series aimed at connecting Israeli entrepreneurs to the U.S. market. So if you don't know AGP, we're an early stage venture capital firm based in Boston and Tel Aviv. We invest exclusively in Israeli companies. And we also have a go-to-market advisory group led by David, actually, that helps Israeli startups kind of penetrate the U.S. market. So one of the ways we work to connect the Israeli startup ecosystem to the U.S. is through interactive forums like this, where we introduce U.S.-based corporate executives and experts to Israeli founders to help them kind of, you know, maybe understand a specific challenge or opportunity. And we're actually, we're very honored to have with us today, Brand Elverston and Myron Berg. Um, Brand and Myron are going to outline some major challenges facing big box retailers mm -hmm. in hopes that, you know, maybe there are solutions to these problems in Israel, maybe even being pointed at Homeland Security or other markets. But I think their goal is to explain the challenge and hear about capabilities that might be used to address those challenges. Uh, and in fact, we'll present you with a kind of form you can use to submit brand and Myron your solutions. And of course, we'll take any questions you have today. So let me like very quickly introduce our guests and then hand over the reins and brand and Myron, I apologize in advance for shortening your ridiculously impressive bios. But uh, so first, Brand Elverston. So Brand spent more than two decades at Walmart, most recently as head of asset protection strategic initiatives. And as you're going to learn, he's an expert on kind of big box risk mitigation and asset protection, and now consults in the space. And by the way, for you IDF guys, uh, Brand was once a far yeah, field artillery officer in the US Army. So you guys can probably compare notes on M120s or something at the end of this call. Uh, also, also want to introduce uh, Myron Burke. Myron also spent two decades at Walmart in a variety of countries, including Japan, and a variety of roles, including head of emerging technologies at Walmart Labs and a principal in their kind of storied innovation group known as Store Number 8. Uh, Myron's been an advisor and friend to AGP and some of our portfolio companies, and we're thrilled to have them both with us here today. So, Brand... And Myron, welcome. And uh, guys, the floor is yours. Thanks, Scott. Greatly appreciate it. And uh, really appreciate the opportunity to be able to present to the audience um, wherever you may be located around the globe. Uh, just an expanded bio on me a little bit beyond what Scott said. Um, Twenty, Almost 22 years at Walmart Asset Protection Division. And it's more broadly in tier one retail. It's not what typically is understood as security. It's more... Uh, risk mitigation in the operations landscape. So that's really where Myron and I uh, crossed paths because uh, Myron um, was the lead for the RFID initiative at Walmart Corporate for a lot of years. And we were part of that in the shrink mitigation piece of it. What can it do? Shrink visibility. Um, and really why we've connected is this is a longstanding passion of mine, even when I was with Walmart is trying to find the proverbial guy in the garage or the non-traditional provider to introduce them to a technology opportunity space to, we'll hear about later in the presentation, get us out of the dark ages. So without the corporate handcuffs on, I no longer have boundaries and we can freely roam the globe and engage with smart talent like we're talking to today and uh, hopefully move the needle and again, get us out of the dark ages. So that's kind of where I am. I've uh, been consulting, what now, six, six plus years, um, largely on the provider side. I don't do anything uh, directly with retail. Uh, but anyway, uh, Myron, you want to give a, give a background? You, you bet. Thanks, Brand, and, and thanks for the nice intro, uh, Scott. Um, Myron Burke, I was with Walmart for 26 years. Um, I did do three years in Tokyo, Japan as an expat. Um, most of that was, I uh, did about five years in operations of stores and then 20 years sitting between tech and operations. And really I became a technology translator for what is the root of the business problem? And then how do we go solve that problem with a forecast for what might be a future problem? 
uh, as we test things in labs and start to identify opportunities. Um, but realizing there's no silver bullets out there. Um, and the problem we're going to talk about today is a 50 plus year problem in retail. And it's one I think that's been kicked down the road, you know, you sort of kicked the can down the road for a long time in this. Um, but, but I had a lot of opportunity to, to work and partner with brand and others in shrink and inventory management and productivity and automation with, with robotics and computer vision, AI, ML. Uh, RFID has been a 25-year career element, I think. I'm still involved in that space today. Um, and, and I think there's some really powerful stuff out there. Uh, I got a chance to exit and retire from Walmart in 2019 uh, and started my own advisory company working on retail tech. Uh, it's called Divergent Technology Advisors. Uh, I focus with technology companies, helping them better understand retail to build a better product versus focusing just on the IP engineering elements of how do you create value from a piece of technology that someone wants to buy. And that includes having a human in the loop of some of those systems. And, and that's where I think a lot of things break down. A lot of times we'll, we'll talk about process breakdowns today. Uh, we'll talk about automation issues. We'll talk about gaps and old habits in the business and, and upstream elements as well. Um, but I've been uh, running my advisory group for about five years, working a lot with startups and enterprise technology companies. Um, I did just ink an SOW with a retailer for the first one last week. Um, so it's a, it's a full circle space in that. But really exciting times. I think there's a lot going on. There's a lot of big problems. And I think we're seeing some of that in this omni-channel experience where I have a ton of stuff flowing online. It's, it's sort of open purchase, open returns, uh, third-party sellers, but we don't know where that third-party product's actually coming from with a pedigree perspective. Um, and, and we're seeing new challenges for that in the marketplace, coupled with changes in global policy uh, on criminal activity and, and uh, things of that nature. So it's a, it's a recipe that's really highlighting shrink numbers. And we're seeing, I think for the first time, CEOs talk about shrink numbers as a material item to financial performance. Um, and I think the problem is there's very little real data about it today. Uh, it's been one that's kind of masked over in the past uh, from that. So uh, enough about me. I think we want to get to the, the topic and, and really have present some challenges and get a rich dialogue. So our challenge to you starting out will be Regardless of where you're setting today, what country you're in, uh, whether organized retail crime or supply chain, uh, pedigree transparency or shrink itself, uh, not necessarily theft, it could be an accounting shrink type of scenario. If that's not a problem or a cultural issue where you're at, we want you to step back and think big. Uh, take any blinders off, take any cultural norms of where I live off and think about what's happening around the world as we look at a global omni-channel manufacturer, transport, 3PL warehouse management, value add service provider, uh, retailer DC and private or public transport again, and then a public store. So there'll be these four nodes of the supply chain where deterioration and in, inaccuracy or value can happen. Um, and we really don't have good insight into that. And so the challenge is think big, ask questions, and then we look forward to coming up with ideas on this journey. You know, we're not going to solve this today and we don't expect, expect somebody to walk out with, uh, here's the thing and let's, let's pick it apart today. This is really about setting a challenge out in front of people and then building a series of events uh, over the next six to 12 months to say, how do we drill down into this, really find things that could uh, work in this scenario or in some scenarios, not necessarily holistic. We're not looking for a silver bullet, uh, but where, where might there be collaborative technologies that can partner and play together across these nodes and these opportunities and, uh, and different uh, asset uh, identifiers uh, in the marketplace uh, to create a whole new bucket of value that for as long as Brandon and I have worked in retail has been a hole in the bucket at the end of the month or the end of the year. And we want to plug that hole um, and, and that's worth lots and lots of money in the marketplace. Okay, thanks, Myron. Um, so guys, if you'll pop me over to the deck or do I need to do something? So as Myron said, just uh, think if anyone has any questions or comments, you're welcome to drop it in the comment section on uh, LinkedIn and we will see that and be able to address them. Okay, um, I've got a bit of a lag here, guys. There we go. So thank you again, everybody, for joining. And as Myron uh, 
said we are going to be talking about the entire landscape of shrink. Um, we're going to talk about the problem versus the hype, and we're going to see a video that may have made its rounds wherever you are on the globe and really walk through the mischaracterization of what shrink is and to introduce everybody to a broader perspective of the opportunity for shrink starts when you create a purchase order. So when Target sends a purchase order to Procter & Gamble for 50 truckloads of Crest White Strips, the opportunity for loss and shrink begins in that journey. So we'll talk through that and kind of, you know, paint the picture on exactly what it is. I will spend some time going through Retail Shrink 101 uh, and the fact that it is not all theft, which is the rampant mischaracterization we're seeing online today, what those basic components are. And to Myron's earlier point, to really share that it's not a lack of uh, wanting to know the data. It is an industry or a portion of the retail industry that is largely um, left to um, traditional methods of calculation. So we don't really know. And we'll walk through some of that to be able to paint a more accurate picture. And then the, only, the reason we're all on the call is the major pain points. Retail, if anybody's ever worked in retail on the call, there are a lot of pain points. But what Myron and I wanted to do is to distill that down to number one, the majors, and number two, those that are inadequately or not addressed through technology or other solutions. And okay, so if you wanna pop over and hit the uh, video, and let's watch this. Caught on video swarming the Topanga Mall Nordstrom in a coordinated attack on the store, Mayor Karen Bass calling for all of them to be held accountable. As many as 30 people, including men and women, snatching tens of thousands of dollars worth of luxury items, leaving the store in shambles. I'm Michelle Fisher. And I'm Jory Rand. This is Eyewitness News at 11. Eyewitness News reporter Amy Powell has the latest on this brazen heist along with reaction from the mayor tonight. Glass shattering, racks and fixtures knocked to the ground. A large crew of thieves caught on cell phone video racing through a Nordstrom store at the Westfield Topanga Mall in Canoga Park, smashing display cases, scooping up armloads of expensive bags and clothing, stunned and frightened shoppers running from the store. We were sitting having coffee and all of a sudden we saw so many people running out of the store. We were not in the store. We were at the entry of the store. So many people coming out. We didn't know. We thought it's a bomb or something. I really didn't understand at first what was going on, and then I realized what was really happening when all the security, everybody was going, you know, into the one area. The robbery happened just after 4 p.m. A mob of 20 to 30 male and female suspects wearing masks and hoodies seen snatching merchandise, running out of Nordstrom and escaping. The LAPD says one security guard was treated after being sprayed with some type of mace or bear spray. No one else was injured. It's not the first time the store has been hit by smash and grab robbers. Numerous shops in the Los Angeles area selling designer merchandise have been targets of similar crimes. It's hard to avoid it, isn't it? Really, you just don't know when it's going to happen. LA Mayor Karen Bass issued a statement calling the Nordstrom robbery unacceptable. She says those who committed these acts and acts like it in neighboring areas must be held accountable. The LAPD is searching for 20 to 30 suspects in connection with the crime. Authorities estimate the loss to the store at between 60 to $100,000. Amy Powell, ABC7 Eyewitness News. Okay, so that really gives us a picture of the entry argument for the mischaracterization. So you see those all day, every day. There, you know, you don't have to look, uh, you know, very far or very much and be able to find those instances. And the yes, organized retail crime, which is of that as an example, is a major problem. They are more violent instances, uh, but organized retail crime has been happening forever. And I've been in retail since 1995, before the internet. I hate to date myself, but before the internet. But the advent of the internet in the early days in retail, when eBay came out, that opened the floodgates to mature the 
uh, resellability of this merchandise from the local farmer's market or a warehouse in downtown or other places to an infinite number of potential buyers. And those struggles that we'll talk about with those uh, platforms, so whether it's Facebook, TikTok, eBay, um, Instagram, anything, uh, is the legislative component that I'll briefly mention that is going to be really the solution. When we shut down the, the ability to be able to resell this merchandise, then we begin to burn, burn the curve. So that video is what has allowed those laymen that are not involved in retail or may not understand the real risk to mistake the idea and the concept of shrink to be 100% only theft. And as we opened up with, that is not the case. There are a couple of ways that we look at shrink and I'll, I'll walk through the component pieces of it. But there's the traditional mindset in big box retail. And again, as Myron said, this is all over the world, worse in some places than others. Um, but the resellability, e-commerce circles the globe. So there's always a willing buyer if you can go into a store and do what happened at Nordstrom. So the traditional mindset is more myopic. It's all theft. Um, many of us may have heard, and, and Scott, I think you mentioned it on the earnings calls, I guess it was two weeks ago, all the major retailers, every one of them talked about shrink. And it ran the gamut from Dick Sporting Goods, which is a major sporting goods outlet here in the United States, pretty much said the entire reason for their abysmal performance was theft. Not necessarily just shrink, but theft. And I've forgotten the metric he used. Maybe somebody remembers, Scott. It was it was a 23% drop in their share price on earnings day. I can't remember, but it was significant. Uh, Target, same kind of deal, that they have a rampant problem with theft. And then you get to the other end of the spectrum. And um, Myron and I's former employee, Doug McMillan, acknowledging, yes, it's a problem, but it's been a problem. And there are pockets of the problem in, in a much broader perspective of saying we get it, but this is not uh, impacting our quarterly results, results obviously, because Walmart did very well in the last quarter. And then you have the CEO, I believe it was yesterday, of Lowe's, one of the major uh, do-it-yourself retailers, admitting that a major component to the theft is the lack of store staff and trained store staff. So since my, what is it now, almost 30 years in retail, shrink is a number that is not shared publicly. Unless a retailer missteps and blurts out a number, typically those numbers are not public information. Uh, you'll find them in a study I'm going to talk about, uh, but it's always anonymous. And if you're in the 1% to 2% range as a major retailer, you're probably in the bracket. But the definition of that shrink is much broader than just theft. And that is the total loss, what's labeled as total loss, <clears throat> which includes process gaps, meaning everything that happens or fails to happen inside, beginning at the purchase order creation, through the supply chain, integrity of the inventory and security of that inventory, and the accompanying billing information that winds up at the retailer and then disaggregated and sent to the responsible store who receives what quantities. The interesting piece of that to keep in mind is that very few opportunities exist in the supply chain for an audit of to say, if I sent uh, Procter & Gamble, I'll pick on them. If I sent Procter & Gamble a purchase order for a million widgets and they billed me for a million widgets, and in fact, only 900,000, made it on the container. And when it got to cross docking and the various distribution points to get it to the Walmart, in this case, the Walmart distribution center, there's no reconciliation beyond maybe pallet reconciliation to say, you know what, I loaded this truck. Yes, in fact, I do have 26 pallets, but there is no item level inventory happening to say of the million widgets, I received a million widgets. If you don't, if you do have a discrepancy with what you were billed and what you physically get, that filters right in to shrink. So it's process gaps. It is all the, all of the occurrences in supply chain 
food safety, food handling processes. If you're a, a major grocer like Kroger, customer and employee safety, and then the shopping experience that uh, many of us may be familiar with and might be fans or opponents, self-checkout. Um, I, I can't remember the exact date, but I know that uh, in my experience, the first real trial that we did with self-checkout was back in the probably 96 or 97. And we on the risk mitigation side had zero to offer to ensure that when Scott used the self-checkout, that in fact, Scott paid for everything. There were no checks and balances. It was a way to do what has been realized is to save payroll and migrate that customer from a manned lane into non-manned self-checkout. And it wasn't until much later, so let's peg that at 1997, there were very few mitigation measures that were effective until probably about 2014. So almost 20 years later is the first advent of a technology that can meaningfully and with high degree of execution, be able to detect those opportunities, whether they're nefarious or not, malicious or not, it doesn't matter, it's product gone and it's shrink for the store. So we'll talk through some of those other avenues. It's not all brick and mortar like we saw on the uh, Nordstrom's call. So depending on the retailer you're talking to, whether they're a traditionalist and they're myopically focused on running down shoplifters, which is a component, or you have a more seasoned uh, risk mitigation professional that understands that the opportunity for shrink occurs at PO creation, all the way to the store receipt, a transaction, transaction on either a manned or unmanned lane or a mobile by online pickup in store. All of that has risk. And really the reason we're talking to everybody here is to say, number one, educate on what the risk is and to be able to introduce opportunity for those that may have an interest in working in this space. Because this, if you take the two industries and the way I usually like to frame this, if, if you look at retail store operations, they have far outpaced in technology, far outpaced the risk mitigation industry that is charged with the responsibility of protecting both profitability and safety. Introduction of self-checkout almost 20 years later before we had a response to that that meant anything. Um, we have buy online and pick up in store. And during COVID, and I'll, I'll talk through COVID because that was a major punctuation of the risks and exposing our gaps that we're seeing today with, and I'm sure everybody's you know seen the news, a hundred billion dollar problem shrink in the U.S. Um, that's true. And, you know, one of the uh, talking points with shrink, it has a very long tail. It's done once a year, typically with an external auditor. If you're a major tier one public uh, company, Target, Walgreens, Home Depot, Lowe's, they inventory their stores once per year. That is the only time they get the reconciliation of their ledger to say in a simplistic explanation, what do the books say you own? and they physically count the store, and this tells us what you actually own, what's in the store. And of course, there's a lot of math back and forth accounting for markdowns and pricing adjustments, concessions, refunds, claims, et cetera. But at the end of the day, those two numbers reconcile. And the definition, definition of shrink is your ledger said you should have $1 million. You counted the store, you have 900,000 you have $100,000 of unknown loss at that point that does not allow you to reconcile. That is the definition of shrink. Hey, I hey Larry, can I, can I, do you want us to kind of po pose some of these questions as we go or do you want us to hold off your if call? It's, yeah, if it's relevant in, in the stream, sure. So I, I have two questions that just came yeah. in the attacks that, that are related to the, the slide you just showed. One question says, um, You've described shrink holistically, not just about theft. Are retailers currently addressing these different components like fraud versus theft versus process gaps separately with separate departments, separate budgets, separate solutions, et cetera? Or are any of them actually built to address these risks holistically right now? Most are built to holistically address it. 
Uh, you will find, though, that in certain retailers, if they get a dollar for investment, they'll spend 60 to 70 cents on the malicious intent, i.e. payroll for shoplifter detectors, restrictive fixturing, things that slow down the malicious intent. And then you'll get to more mature organizations that Myron and I are familiar with that actually that, that fully understand that there are a lot of process gaps that have risks. For example, the buy online pickup in store. So it's it's kind of a mixed bag, but in my 20, well, now 30 years in the industry, we are much better in leadership awareness in this industry of total loss versus the top of the slide with it's all theft. Yeah. I, I, I'd add a, a little bit of color to that from my experience. I think a lot of companies are structured to go after the holistic issue. I don't think the teams are actually empowered to address the issues holistically because two things come to mind. One, until recently, until this year, I don't, I don't think you ever heard leadership coming out and saying, how bad they never wanted to believe they were as bad as the numbers in an inventory said they were. Yep. But you can't be losing 8 billion or, or, or however many billions of dollars a year. Right. Um, and in some cases it, it's now so much that it's material to the point that like, if, if you could stop that, you, you don't need to grow your profit. You could actually lower margins because that's, that's profit going out. Right. Because you're paying for product that you don't have and didn't sell. So it's a big, big impact on a percentage basis to sales revenue. Um, and then I think there's a lot of discussions where it becomes a bit of a battle in the dialogue between our, uh, our cost to maintain 100% accuracy, it will be more than the impact of shrink that we can quantify and believe. And so I think there's always this, this cost battle, and, and that's where I think um, you know, emerging tech groups and lab groups have an advantage because you can actually go in and say, hey, I can do a study and track this from cradle to grave on a, on a very small scale and actually show you where percentages, and I think we have a slide in there that kind of breaks it down, but where percentages of different things are happening. And, and you kind of start with the bottom 10 or bottom 20%. Like, what are the worst performers? Let's go fix that. And then there'll be another bottom 20% that we can go after over a series of time. And, and I think too, too often shrink and the symptoms of shrink get attacked as a project <coughs> with budget that's based around a project. And that's what I mean by they're not empowered to go after it uh, in that. Um, and, and it's expensive to go play with new or emerging technologies because you're finding a lot of the R&D cost of that. Yeah. Um, but I think this problem has now gotten to a point where it has to be looked at differently um, because it's just not one that's getting addressed holistically. I think there's, there's tangents that are being touched on and addressed to different levels in different companies. But again, it's sort of project because you have a, a team that goes and looks here and they fix something and roll something out. And then, okay, we got that. We got our arms around that. Now we're going to go look here, but it's the same team. Um, whereas, you know, if, if Microsoft ran software that way, we wouldn't do what we do with Excel today. Like there's a team that runs Excel and reinvention and maintenance of Excel every day of the week, 300 of the year, 365 days a year. So I think, um, this group, the groups that support this issue aren't structured that way. Yeah. Well, let me ask you just, I, I want you guys to move on, but one, one more question, because I think it's relevant to this slide. It said, um, you described one problem of item level discrepancy in, a P, in the P&G example regarding the number of products expected versus delivered. Is there a desire by big box retailers to collaborate with the P&Gs of the world on these solutions at the ecosystem level? Or are you, I think they mean you brand, are you thinking about this as a retailer specific problem? Well, um, I'll, I'll take the high road on that one and say, you know, we are making great progress with understanding this is a we problem and not a they. Um, and that's new. Uh, my direct experience with a major CPG in the early or the late 90s when eBay, you know, all, a lot of product we started seeing going to eBay and we would call the CPG and they're like, hey, you got to help us. And it was pretty much the Heisman, meaning stiff arm. Uh, good luck with that retail. And it was always a problem. And even the platform owner, eBay, back in the day, was very disinterested in doing anything to validate 
the sellers that were selling product on their websites. Fast forward 20 years, we're in a much better place. It's not utopia, but we, it collectively, when the CEOs on the calls, the Brian Cornells of Target, the Doug McMillans with Walmart, um, when they make those very rare comments about the risk to shrink and loss, that's new. And that tells me from 30 years in the saddle that I think we got their attention. And to Myron's point, is that going to precipitate real action? And meaning, are we going to move beyond the locking showcases and a retired police officer at the door? Or are we going to invest and explore in more holistic solutions? And I'll throw out some names here, guys, <clears throat> um, like Everseen. They do more than through AI on the existing camera network. They do more than just tell you that Scott's at register 12, Seth checkout, he hit tender, and there's still four items in the grocery cart that are not on that receipt and be able to tell me that real time. Um, that was a major move forward in helping the retailer get their arms around whether it's malicious or not, the loss is associated with self-checkout, which we have proven over and over are disproportionately more than a man lane. So we're in a much better place, but we still got a long way to go. Got it. Okay. Um, there it is. Okay, so lead contributors and some things we're gonna talk about a couple of times. So. We've talked about what shrink is and what it isn't. Um, we talked about the mischaracterization and, and the pigeonhole we jump in to say it's all theft and that if all if I just lock it up and put a lot of alarms and you know a SWAT team around the display, we'll be fine. And you know a couple of things over my years and during my uh, time at Walmart. Um, I was the staff director and I had under my purview I had the analytics team the tech team, the systems team, I had the ops liaison team, and then training and probably a couple more. And one thing that was very unpopular for me to say on stage, but it's a true statement, is that if you persistently have shrink in a given store year after year after year, one, or, one of two things are true. You're, obvious, you're either not good at your job, meaning impacting shrink for whatever reason, or theft is not the majority of your problem in that box because what you're doing today clearly is not moving the needle. And that's not a comment a lot of career loss prevention asset protection people like to hear, but in those stores, if you take for, and I'm not going to mention names, but in conversations with some of the major retailers, with people I know, is talking about their shrink results they shared on the calls. And talking to them offline is like, Brand, it's no different than when you were with Walmart and you used to crank out the heat maps of where the problems are. It is not every one of 4,200 Walmart stores. It's not every one of 2,000 Target stores. There are pockets that disproportionately drive a lot of the shrink and the majority of your fleet, call it 75%, always are going to have shrink, but it's not in the unmanageable specter that it is with the 25% of the chain. But everyone has a risk to theft and loss and shrink. So let's, let's back up to 2020, March of 2020 when all of us know what happened in March of 2020, the pandemic hit, we started going through lockdowns, major retailers are cutting store hours, staffing understandably was reduced mainly because of hours, but a drop in business, we didn't need that. And the staff that we did have was reallocated to cleaning product, counting people at the door, trying to maintain some order of in stock in the store, doing just about everything else except paying attention to the malicious intent people that roam the stores. And that is nirvana for a thief. If nobody's paying any attention to me and nobody's in the store, which unfortunately is still true, that is heyday. 
that is all too easy to be able to engage. And I'm not talking about specifically just the ORC guys. I'm talking about the opportune, the high school kid, the person that just is going to steal, you know, a, a box of Crest White Strips and um, the newest video game. Because all of that adds up and contributes. But the staffing reductions in most of my conversations with the tier ones is it pretty much boils down to this, Brian, we pick a number, 20%. We reduced our payroll line, but 20% as a result of COVID. We survived COVID. And if you're Walmart, you crushed it during COVID at a 20% reduction. So do we really expect <clears throat> that we're going to go back to pre-COVID staffing levels and up the PL line on payroll by 20%? So all of the manual processes that Myron talked about. So item level checking in at the back door is a manual process if you're going to do it. No, but many retailers do not do item level at the back door. But if they did, it was a human being saying, okay, there should be 50 boxes of Crest White Strips in these on this pallet. Unless they physically count it, we haven't a clue. We get the bill, we paid for 50, but we really have no idea what actually just came into the store. Being able to unlock locking showcases. All of us shop in stores. We're probably all frustrated with that before COVID. Now it's even worse. And we know for a fact that locking showcases reduce sales. It depends on the product, whether it's impulse or consumable, et cetera, et cetera. But in, in aggregate, they reduce sales by dub, double digit percentages. But if nobody's on the sales floor to be able to help Myron or Myron's wife or whoever to access that product, it's worse now than it was before. But the environment we're in and the all too frequent mischaracterization is it's all theft. Well, my response to theft, if I'm a retailer, lock it up or run a cable through. You've seen the maybe the logging chains running through the freezer cooler door handles uh, to keep that locked up. Um, so the staffing is not insignificant. It is a major contributor and can be a major deterrent to not only you know, effective customer service, but also in curbing um, the malicious intent in the stores. So assumed receipt of merchandise, you know, certainly at Walmart, uh, and I'm gonna assume at all major retailers, they get a bill electronically uh, through their distribution system about the only manual process that occurs is matching a seal on a truck to the paperwork to say, yep, it's this trailer and hit accept. And all of your inventory levels in the store, the physical count inventory levels go up and your retail ownership goes up and they pay the bill, et cetera, et cetera. Nobody counts to make sure that if in fact I did get that merchandise. Now, on occasion, high risk stores, if they're getting big, low quantity products like, you know, Super Bowl Sunday, I'm going to get 50, 85 inch TVs. OK, it's fairly quick to be able to count 85 TVs. Did we in fact get it? But the nickel and diming is death by a thousand cuts on the product that is never counted. That is high density, high volume. And we haven't any idea we're paying for that and really don't know for sure that we got it. And that responsibility goes all the way up purchase to the purchase order creation. And that's where some of my work with the major CPGs is having them come to the table to provide some level of assurance. In other words, prove to me you're right. We're making that assumption all the way down to the retail distribution center, but we're making an assumption you're right. And if you're a major CPG and it's not insignificant the amounts you're invoicing, Show me how you know that, in fact, there's integrity in your supply chain and that, in fact, we do get that product. And again, it's a new day. Their ears are turned on uh, in this era simply because a lot of the earnings calls. So assume receipt of merchandise. That is a major challenge. But so let's let's walk through this scenario. If Myron's the store manager in store 12 and he receives the truck. And he does the scenario that most major retailers do. I don't item level check in. I check the seal, finalize, up goes physical and retail inventory. We're off to the races. He does his annual inventory nine, 10 months later. He gets a shrink number. And 
it's oftentimes bloody and it's far worse now than in my 30 years, all the shrink numbers we're seeing from the major retailers. And he knows that he should have had $10 million in the building and they counted eight. He's got a $2 million shrink and whatever that percentage of his top line sales are, that's the percentage. All too often to the earlier question, Scott, the assumption made is the gap happened in the building. Virtually 100% of the time it is, okay, number one, if I'm a traditional thinker, it was theft. And, you know, the comments are, I told you guys I needed more people catching shoplifters. I got to lock this up. There are a lot of assumptions made because Myron is a store manager. He has no idea if he ever even received the product. So what locking it up does or putting an EAS tag on does or putting it in a restrictive fixture or behind the counter or any, any of those malicious intent risk mitigation measures, they will have zero impact on the inventory result. Back to my earlier comment, either you're not good at your job or theft is not the major problem in your shrink number. So we have to be sure and put integrity from the PO creation to the floor. Now, I don't ever want to be accused of saying, Brand, you spent 30 years in this, in this industry. How in the hell do you think theft is not a problem? I do think it's a problem. And it's about as bad as I've ever seen it in my 30 years. And retailers uh, that I'm intimately familiar with, their shrink numbers, aggregate annual numbers, are numbers I never even heard of before. It's that bad. So absolutely, it's a problem. Absolutely, ORC is a problem. Absolutely, the reduction in staffing on the sales floor has punctuated all of those manual tasks that used to be provided by people that either aren't being done or, or are being, uh, I'll just say it, half-assed with some sort of a stopgap technology to be able to say, okay, yeah, this is what happened. So the non-traditional tender, and again, uh, Myron does a really good job in rounding out a conversation. That's probably the only reason I hang out with him, is reminding <laughs> us that the opportunity, the gap opportunity. So buy online, pick up in store. We go back to COVID. There were retailers that were well positioned to be able to handle that, and there were some that weren't even in that ballpark, and they suffered. So most major retailers that had a good footprint e-com. They had a you know, good digital uh, presence, i.e. target.com. I could order merchandise on the Target app, go to the store, pick it up. In my firsthand knowledge, the risk mitigation measures associated that should have been in place to handle those non-traditional sales, and I absolutely understand and support the pace at which they pursued it, because that's what we had to do back then but there were no suitable risk mitigation measures put in place. So if Scott orders something on target.com and I got my pickup order number 386, and I know that Myron, my buddy is the order filler at that store and he's on shift. I text Myron, Hey buddy, my order number is 386. How about hook me up, fill it. And Oh, by the way, for this weekend's party, a couple bottles of Jack and gray goose would be great. There are very few, if any, controls in that process to say what was dispensed to the customer at the pickup area and the parking lot versus what was paid for. And that is a major gap, particularly when you see the increases, double digit increases in some cases of e-com sales and in increasing their penetration and top line sales as a percent. Mobile shopping. Uh, all of us probably have heard of iFi, AIFI, certainly have heard of Amazon Go, those stores that provide cashierless stores. And believe it or not, some major retailer operations group uh, have contacted me on what is available if I did a cashierless store and the store is no longer 400 square feet on a corner in Manhattan or Tel Aviv, but it is a 200,000 square foot store. How do I manage my risk to say when Myron comes in, pulls out his smartphone, scans his own merchandise, throws it in his backpack, hits tender on the Lowe's.com app and heads for the door. There is zero assurance in that scenario, big box, 
did Myron actually pay for everything that was in his backpack? And as you may, and this is public, I'm not saying, nor would I ever say anything that is confidential, but that is one of the main reasons Walmart never could successfully pull off true mobile shopping. And that was a public statement made by, I believe it was Doug, if not certainly the CFO, that they could not manage the shrink risk. In a, in a hi-fi environment, and I saw them at Euro Shop, that was 2019, very impressive. I tried everything that I could think of in my experience to defeat the system, and it caught everything that I was hiding, mixing up the shelves, the labels. It was awesome. But that isn't scalable in a 200,000 square foot store because it is camera intensive. So in a Walmart store, let's say you've got 200 cameras around the sales floor in the back room and entrances. I can't affordably, I can't have it make sense if I need 5,000 cameras and the associated uh, computational horsepower and storage and all that behind it to have it make sense. And we'll talk about that when I get to, you know, the two or three things that uh, we really need some help with. Um, so that was JWO, the, the Just Walkout technology. They're good players in the space, but there is no solution on the street for big box. So that's why you don't see penetration of Just Walkout in major, um, major retailers. Sorry about the lag, guys. There we are. So this is important. And I hope everybody can see it because I'm struggling to see it, but I know the data. This is a survey that is completed by just about every major retailer in the United States and some international, uh, sponsored by the National Retail Federation, which most of you may be familiar with. Some major, one of the biggest trade trade organizations on the planet, uh, next to Retail Industry Leaders Association or RELA. And this study is simply a questionnaire that goes to every retailer. And I'm intimately familiar with it because I completed Walmart's information for 20 of my 22 years there. And what is striking is to the layman, this appears to say that 66% of every dollar I lose on that, on Myron's inventory, remember I said he was supposed to have 10 million and they counted eight. Myron, where the heck is 2 million bucks? This data will tell you that the majority of that 2 million bucks was stolen, either internally, meaning our own associates, and that's very damaging. In fact, per incident rates of an internal theft compared to a shoplifter apprehension over the years is usually about 10x. Now, it's different when you have an ORC case like you saw at Nordstrom's. I mean, that's that was $100,000 in one swoop. But let's not forget to pay attention to our own employees that are hooking each other up like the buy online pickup in store. That's an internal case. But to say that 66% or whatever those numbers add up, 65% is a mischaracterization. But let's go back to what I talked about earlier, that we do not have item level financial shrink on that inventory day. So when I give that number as the head auditor to Myron that night, and Myron starts feeling sick because he's like, where in the hell did $2 million go? I'm at a 20% shrink rate. Um, just throwing a number out there. I can tell Myron everything at top line. I gave him his dollar loss and his percent of sales. And I can take that down to department level. So cosmetics, hardware, jewelry, HBA, health and beauty aids, um, apparel, even food some food if it's inventory at retail. I don't want to make this more complicated than it needs to be because the point is simply, I can only go down to department level on inventory day. In other words, if Myron were to say, I need to know what the shrink is on my Apple iPhone 15s, retailers do not get that on inventory day. They have relatively sophisticated approximations and I know that because I did those for years but it is not a true financial reconciliation on that item. All you have is the physical inventory discrepancy. Your item file before the day of inventory said you had 100 Apple iPhone 15s and we counted it and you had 80. Where the hell did the other 20 go? It shrank and we're back to the assumption of that 65%. They stole it. Unless you counted it coming in the back door, do you really know if you actually got them? 
So that 65% as an aggregate number, and again, I'm going back to people that you know may say Brand's lost his mind saying theft isn't a problem. And as an aggregate number, I never subscribe to that. We always had the feeling that understanding total store operations and the gaps that we had, even as sophisticated, in this case, as sophisticated as Walmart's logistics systems are, people make mistakes and things occur. So we never made the assumption and, and price changing and you know uh, adjusting retail inventory in the store multiple thousands of times a week with price changes. If it's a human in the process, as Myron said before, there is a disproportionate opportunity for an error. And the fewer people you have in the store, the more they're trying to take on, you amplify that risk for shrink. So I never subscribe to that 65%. It's a guess because back, back to where I was on this survey, these are estimations the retailer completes. This is not data brand goes to. And I know everything that got stolen because when, usually when somebody steals something, they're not stopping to tell somebody so they can make a record of it. It's just gone. So the appreciation of all the operations gaps further complicated now because of COVID uh, and the buy online and pick up in store and mobile and all of those non-traditional channels if I had to guess, if I was filled out that survey today, it would be a much more equal picture of theft risk. Now, it's not to say that if you go to a really tough area that's in a bad neighborhood, it may be higher theft percentage to 70, 80%. But as an aggregate corporate number, I, I think that is grossly overestimated for a lot of the reasons that we talked about. Myron, did you wanna say something? I saw you. No, I was just doing a doing a quick time check and want to make sure we get to the the summer points. Yep. Uh, so we... Yep. Oh, absolutely. So, hopefully, no questions there, guys. This is subjective data, estimated by retail executives. This is not like sales data. So, Scott, as you well know, if I'm Walmart or Target or Lowe's, I can tell you within five seconds every drill bit I sold around the world, and I know my margin. I know what I paid for it. I know how many I sold. How many's in it. I cannot do that with shrink. I have no clue until I do the annual inventory at the end of the year. And they're like, hey, there you go, Myron. You got to write a check for 2 million bucks because it's gone. It is, it is decades old antiquated uh, methodology that we don't have. So this, this slide kind of more visually puts in perspective the quadrants of opportunity that I talked about. So you've got the process gaps, you got the supply chain gaps, which are real and present. And we know we had a ton of supply chain uh, hiccups during COVID with the um, ports, the LA port backed up, couldn't get container ships to say that nothing was lost in the COVID years. Um, is rather naive to say nothing could have happened in supply chain, so it had to happen in the store. Theft, I've talked about a lot. And then you have your accounting retail versus cost, which are different. But most of your major retailers, I'll say that safely, inventory at retail is certainly admiring in my um, expertise that retail, and, and there's some different um different gaps in there in the process. And across the bottom on the Y or on the X axis um, is just a flow and risks are present in every one of them. You know, the manufacturer, the warehousing, the retailer, retail store, there are gaps along the process. So, so what? <clears throat> you guys may be saying like, all right, what difference does this make? And how does this apply to something that I may be able to impact? Here are four unrestricted, and Myron is an engineer by trade and uh, uh, did his best to confine me to some limitations of what's uh, the laws of physics and what's really possible. But, I, but I'm a little bit more, um, what the hell, uh, put it out there and somebody may shock us. So these are four things. Of all of the problems that we talked about, understanding shrink is way more than just theft. Four things that we would ask that our listeners entertain. One is virtual customer service. 
So I don't know certainly the age of everybody on the call, but most of us are old enough to remember Star Trek and the beam me up Scotty. And you saw the white star bursts in the air and all of a sudden a 3D image of a person appeared and could have a conversation. If we don't have people on the sales floor today, which we don't, we probably are not going to increase that, which we won't. Theft deterrence, a significant component of, as the CEO of Lowe's said correctly, physical presence on the sales floor matters, not only for customer service, but certainly for deterrence of theft. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to stop what you saw at Nordstrom's. You probably could have had a SWAT team sitting there and it would have still happened. Probably would have been a lot of uh, firearms exchange, but it would have still happened. We're not talking about that component, which is relatively infrequent compared to loss mm -hmm. across the scope. But a hologram type on a, an existing camera network to be able to be motion sensitive that when Myron walks into the aisle of liquor, for example, and he has a dwell time of more than one minute, that probably means he has a question it would have the system, uh, whatever, I'm not a ones and zeros guy, but the hologram would appear and th either through AI or a real person off site would engage and say, sir, I see you've been standing in front of the vodka aisle. Are there any questions I can answer for you? That is a huge number one customer service replacement that we're not gonna go back to humans. It is scalable obviously, but it matters in countless studies on the deterrence to malicious intent. So virtual customer service, hologram, that would be awesome. Cashierless door, I talked about that. How do you handle an Amazon Go at 200,000 square feet without saturating the ceiling with cameras? Because that is a non-starter. So there's a huge opportunity there to be able to say, I have a solution, whatever that is, that you don't need uh, you know, 3,000 cameras in the ceiling, we can do X, Y, and Z. But that is a major roadblock to why the major retailers are not using true, full mobile shopping today. It's pretty much confined to convenience stores. The Apple store, and as I used to say with the Apple guys to aggravate them, I'm like, you know, I've got bathrooms bigger than an Apple store in my Walmart stores. I don't tell me how you do cool things because I'm like 50 times bigger than you are. Um, so the cashierless store, true mobile shopping, risk deterrent. How do you validate that Scott actually paid for everything he just put in his backpack or he just walked out the door with? And then unlocking merchandise. And this is, you may have seen some of the posts online, all the lock and showcases. I was in Chicago last week with Procter & Gamble. They're one of my clients. And with the challenge of brand, how do we not do this? Because P&G puts out a lot of cool product. It's got a really good uh, black market rate of sale. Tide pods in the laundry detergent, um, Crest white strips, toothpaste even, whitening toothpaste. They're popular items, uh, wet shave category. They always have been. But how do we not? lock this up because retailers are in the position, firsthand knowledge again, in the United States of deleting items from the modular, the shelf, because they cannot keep it in stock because of theft. They are deleting merchandise. Now, obviously that's not sustainable. No major retailer is gonna say, well, if they steal it, just delete it. Because at some point, until you run out of a willing buyer on eBay, you're gonna start chipping away at your modular in your 200,000 square foot store in five years is gonna be 100,000 square feet because you're not selling much. So it's not a sustainable nor a responsible answer, but it's where the industry is today, unfortunately. And that's why Scott so kindly has connected us with all you guys to hopefully plant a seed that these four major pain points are largely unanswered or inadequately answered. Right. So Brad, that's, would... go ahead. I would just add a fifth to this as we wrap up here um, that I think that confirmation of units shipped uh, at the item level is an upstream element. So, you know, if you think of that quadrant slide, we're looking at 
these are all the components of shrink that's accounting issues, it's uh, worker issues, it's process gaps, uh, in some cases, internal external theft or rerouting of product. If we can identify that that happens upstream, then you can start to make adjustments downstream or say, hey, don't accept that number. We're going to get a new number together. And, and I think that's an important piece. So it's not just down at the store level. We're looking at how do you go up this sort of use case ladder through the supply chain. And if we know where errors happen at a node in that supply chain that was across the bottom of that, then we can start to resolve for those and then leverage technologies downstream or if we're having more issues upstream, we may not need as much technology downstream because we have better controls in place through the network. So just think about it from a broad context, guys. And I know we've just kind of thrown a lot at you of, of, of shrink detail, but really want to catalyze the backstory to, to say, how do we think about this from a greenfield perspective um, and what collaborative technologies can actually come together and, and have a deeper dialogue at a future, future date and time. Yeah, that, that's a great lead in, Myron. Thank you. Um, so the solution set, uh, a su successful sh solution set, I can't say that three times fast, is one that solves for more than the malicious intent. So the industry, as long as I've been out there and largely it's still there today, most of what you see in the store is designed to exclusively deter theft. That's it. It's a one trick pony, as we say. And those that can do more, so Everseen, I talked about Everseen, the artificial intelligence, risk mitigation over self-checkout in the aisle, et cetera. Uh, Zero Eyes, active shooter AI in a parking lot can tell me that an AK-47, 150 feet out in the parking lot, is headed towards the door of the store. Um, Occucon, another AI solution provider in the UK that can... Uh, within 30 seconds, detect clear liquid on a store floor and report it. Um, so with few exceptions, the industry is, as I referenced earlier, is woefully behind that of retail operations and only exasperating the gaps of being able to mitigate said risks, i.e. BOPUS and those things. So we're inviting fresh thought, guys. I know, you know, and I, I emailed Scott earlier and I said, I'll be really happy if I leave people with more questions than answers because we don't have the answers. Myron and I together have been in retail a half a century and there is nothing that is ready to go to address those four pain points that will help us get out of the dark ages, get us away from locking showcases, get us away from the reliance of a physical person on the sales floor, because that's real money and you have execution problems, et cetera. There are no solutions to help target to truly mobile shopping through and through. So the fresh thought, um, and, and I used to do this um, when I was at Walmart, but again with uh, the corporate handcuffs on. I would go to DARPA, Defense Advanced Research Projects Agencies. I know the IDF guys on the call understand who they are. Uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology, the NIST. I went to MIT, Caltech, Lockheed, Boeing, every non-traditional uh, innovative entity I could think of and do exactly what I just completed here in hopes of stirring fresh thought and saying, not looking for like Myron said in the beginning, we're not looking for somebody to raise their hand and say, oh, hell, I got that. Um, because shame on Myron and me if we didn't already know that. Um, but this is to stoke everybody that's listening to say, hmm, interesting. Now, here's where we go uh, from here, Scott, if we can. Um, I would love it to have more players in the industry that when you go to a retail trade conference, be that NRF, RELA, NGA, um, GSX, South by Southwest, you name it, largely it's the same stuff every year. And I've been doing it for 20, almost 30 years now, and it's pretty tired. It's the same stuff. You go to Euro Shop or Euro Sys in Dusseldorf in February, and it's different in a good way. You get more startups, you get more creativity, you get more technology people willing to take a risk. That's where I met iFi in 2019 and we know where they are as a company. Um, so I will be attending in February uh, in Dusseldorf. Would love to connect with anybody that's attending. But Nirvana for me is on my headstone, I introduced 
a bunch of new providers to the industry that are truly making a difference in an innovative way. And it's not version two of a locking showcase. Um, last point I'll make, solve for more than the, the nefarious intent. We're not, can, we're not looking for next generation locking showcases. We're looking for no showcases and still be able to reasonably protect prop. So uh, that's, that's kind of the elevator pitch in a, an hour and four minutes. <laughs> that was great. Um, really amazing. Like I have some questions. I think David has some questions that came in and David, I know you also have a URL at some point you want to share where yeah. you know, people can get in touch with Myron um, uh, and brand and kind of, you know, provide some, some options and solutions. So, but David, yeah. why don't you, if you, you have a couple of questions, maybe you start. Yeah, so I'm going to jump in with a couple of questions from the, you know, wearing the startup hat or like the solution uh, provider hat. Um, yeah. One thing is you mentioned that it's not just malicious uh, intent that you want to prevent, but it's also, you know, legitimate advisors just helping them uh, go through. The solutions, do they really have to be completely passive on the shopper side or do you think that the shoppers will cooperate? So, for example, like the hologram you said, would, it, would a VR thing where I could just kind of hold, hold up my phone and get the 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 associate, would that be good enough? Or do you want something that actually actively comes out to, comes to me without any effort on my side? In the, in that specific case, separate. Um, because, you know, I think on a separate topic, you know, to some degree in some locales around the country, I think retailers have, have really um, over digitized and over teched the stores. So separate on the camera, not through their phone to be able to scan a QR code and all of a sudden a live person appears on their phone. Uh, no, because two, two things. One is most of the sophisticated retailers could probably figure out how to do that themselves. But I don't know that anybody, any major retailer is going to put, put their big fat wallet in the street on developing hologram technology to what Myron has uh, explained to me is still a bit off, but it's still that stopgap for no boots on the ground, so to speak. So It's, it's hard. I know a company yeah. doing some of it pretty well, but it's hard. I, I think my, my answer to that question is just slightly different. I think if people can show a way to grab attention of a shopper, and I think there's buckets of shoppers and there's buckets of workers across this whole supply chain piece. I think if you can find a way to grab attention that's different than all the spam and crap we get on our phones today, because the, the marketing companies have kind of ruined the phone as a tool uh, from that perspective, if you can find a way to grab attention that changes behavior uh, for a group, a significant group of people, and there may be a trust score that gets that gets bucketed into this, because some of these crimes that we're seeing today in theft of self checkouts and things walking out of the store or BOPIS, they're crimes of opportunity because we've made it so easy. Or some people feel like, hey, I'm having to do more work. I don't get any more value. My prices are up, so I feel like I've earned the right to put forty bucks of stuff in my pocket. If you can if you can change that and counter that and start to chip away at that slide that Brad uh, Brand showed about the unknown components, I think it's worth looking at. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the engineer in the lab that I kind of like, Hey, I, there's not a bad idea. Like show me how you can do it different than something that's just a, a text message that pops up or a beat that comes with 900 text messages I get a day that I don't want <laughs> uh, because I'll just ignore it. Yeah. Um, so I think it has to be, how do you, how do you get out of the box in that thought? Okay, uh, sounds good. Sounds interesting. And then the other question I had was kind of the the solutions. I mean, uh, you know, you were mentioning that you want more of a holistic solution, like that takes care of everything. But you don't want to add, you know, five thousand cameras in the store. But what if you, you know, maybe the cameras in the warehouse, but a different solution on the floor and a third part in the parking lot? Would that make sense also? It if it would. You know, I don't want to come in saying we got a spec sheet because we don't. I certainly don't. Right. Myron's way smarter than I am, but I don't have a spec sheet to say you got to do all this. So we're wide open on that. Um, what would be uh, the guardrails or the caution statement I would give on something is that be careful not to uh, suggest boiling the ocean and solving every pain point retail ever had. Because Myron and I both have a history in that, and that typically, in my experience, is not successful because it's simply not doable. It's not realistic. So we're okay with, you know, Startup X saying, look, dude, here's what I can do. I'm really good at this. Will that work? But I'm, you know, I'm not really good at, at this. 
But we, uh, my encouragement and where I've always been successful at Walmart and getting over the hump and, you know, everybody knows Myron and I are not representing Walmart. We don't work there. I'm just using them as an example. But what helps us be successful is when I, in asset protection, the director went to Myron in operations, because you got to go through ops, is that if my headline was, Myron, I can help you fix in stock. I can help you validate what comes in the back door. I can help you reduce uh, your uh, environmental footprint. And oh, by the way, I can stop these crackheads from stealing all of the Tide Pods on the shelf. If, if, it's, if it's positioned like that, I have Myron's attention. If I go into Myron and say, hey, dude, I need $70 million to get people to stop stealing Tide, Myron's going to do what he did to me a couple of times, kind of nod, smile, and go refill his coffee cup. I'm, I'm, I'm already done. So yeah. keep keep that in mind. we got to solve more than the malicious intent because at the end of the day, we're, it's 100% about the honest customer. And well, and, every- and I think there's a there's a full circle on that comment because my, my response to that would have been, are you telling me we lost $70 million in tide? Like there's a break-even point. Yep. And the challenge was if you go back to the inventory where you get it at a department level, he can say, I can't answer that. Yep. I know we lost $70 million in this detergent department, but I don't know that it was tied pots. And that's where I think the discussion really falters because of some of that lack of visibility. And I think there's technologies that'll, that'll accelerate some of that, but uh, the collaborative element I think is essential for this. It, it, it'll be a series of companies working together to solve a series of vertical challenges. Can, can I pose two, I know we're over time, but can I pose two more questions that, that came in that I think are relevant? Sure. One, one's related to the topic that was just discussed, which I think is asking about other types of obstacles that retailers may have besides price. So like, for example, you guys mentioned the biggest obstacle, one of the biggest obstacles to cashierless stores was like cost and camera costs. Like you're not going to put 5,000 cameras in each Walmart. Yep. So this person kind of says, if we could solve that, meaning large scale coverage with four or five devices that aren't just video, what would be the other obstacles that retailers would would have to that? Like what's, what's the, if, if, in other words, if it's not just cameras, if that, if that problem went away, what's the next problem or obstacle that they would have to face to for deployment? Yeah, I, I'll jump in on this one because I, I think in a, in a public facing store that's north of 3000 people a day, the, the really hard piece is knowing if Scott's a traditional shopper who's becoming into basket and browsing the shelves and brand has done this online paid for it with my mobile thing and, and check out, there's not a beacon over your head that says I've paid and I have it. So in a hybrid environment like that, a hybrid operating environment, the ability to know who's done a transaction and paid for goods without stopping and inconvenience them versus who hasn't becomes the challenge that becomes a staffing challenge, or you have to have some sort of identity issue. And, and unfortunately we have four or five States in the U S who have sort of outlawed, um, you know, biometric identity pieces. So I think that's where the, 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 the next hurdle comes in because we all sort of say we jump to biometrics and there's a lot about that where New York and Chicago and other places have sort of taken some pretty hard stances. So um, I think that's probably the next bigger hurdle is how does somebody stand at a front door or a gateway know you paid, you didn't pay, you're green, you're red. Got it. Um, so one last question, which I'm combining two or three questions into one, which is really around like how how the U.S. retailers are are playing, like how are they playing in this space? Do they like, uh, Myron, you were at Walmart Labs, like do, do most of the retailers have kind of labs or skunk works where they're testing and playing with things? Um, you know, are they doing pilots and like you got any perspective you might have on how some of the bigger players like to play in this space? Yeah. Um, I would say most of the bigger retailers have a type of lab. I would say that my experience is the type of lab that they have is more about testing a solution that is based around a strategic cost savings or a strategic known benefit. 
and they're sort of classifying how much ROI can I book? I think very few have what I call true discovery labs where, where I've got a separate 300 gig network that's not behind the firewall and I can bring a robot in and plug it in and run it to say, show me it works. Or I can bring in a wireless power company that just got six new patents and say, nobody can do wireless power since Nikolai Tesla and he didn't pull it off. And so show me it works and I'll buy $50,000 of engineering services. That, that's the type of labs I'm used to running and like proving out, hey, this has real legs to it. And it may take 10 years, but I'm willing to work with you for 10 years. Um, so I think there's a lot of labs, but they're not really emerging tech labs to go tackle these big nugget problems. They're much more about we want to get the best cost performance on a ratio to drive a cost line down. Cause I think most retailers have, have got attached to that cost line drug. Um, pretty, pretty handily. That's great. Um, all right. Look, I think we're, we're kind of, uh, we're pushing, we've pushed beyond the boundaries of our, of our time constraints. So like, this has been amazing. Um, uh, David put in the chat uh, a URL that everyone can access. I know that there's some people who had other questions about container weights and truck weights and uh, other solutions they might have. Like, we're happy to make the connection to Brand and Myron. Feel free to use that URL. Feel free to reach out to David and I for anything, um, you know, and we'll try to, um, you know, try to make the connection. But, um, you know, Brand and Myron, this has been like, just fantastic and uh, like very educational. So thanks again uh, for joining us today. Thank, thank you guys for hosting and, and thanks to everyone. I know we went over on time. We appreciate your, your time and your patience with us uh, in that uh, as we go through the, the depth of discussion. So thank you all very, very much. It's been thanks, great. Thank you. Thank you. Scott, for you. Me, you know, thanks for joining. And, and David, sorry, didn't mean to cut you off. Uh, no, I just want to thank uh, Brent and Myron for joining. And uh, also I want to thank our event partners, uh, Reblon, the PR agency, uh, Type 5 Space Tech Ventures. And they looped in a bunch of their technologies to this uh to this session because I know you were saying you're looking for outside the box and Yael Yeager who does uh, process optimization consulting for a lot of the uh, Israeli IDF uh, graduates uh, that are into startup now so she's working with their communities and so she brought a lot of their stuff in here also perfect awesome. thanks again everyone okay, appreciate it. Appreciate it. bye bye